Okay, so we're going to be starting blood vessels. So <clears throat> angiology, this is the study of the anatomy and physiology and some related diseases uh, of the blood vessels. When we talk about blood vessels in general, you're going to hear us talk about these three different uh, layers. Uh, there's going to be the tunica interna. It's also known as the tunica intima, and that is the innermost layer. So it's the closest, the one that's adjacent to the lumen where the blood is actually flowing through. Then there's the tunica media, also known as the tunica musculosa. Musculosa because it's smooth muscle. <clears throat> and then there's the tunica externa, which is also referred to as the tunica adventitia, which is the outermost layer. So again, if we want to look at those three layers, we'll see we have the tunica interna or tunica intima. That's made up of endothelial cells. You can see it's one cell layer thick. They are simple squamous epithelium, very good for diffusion, the diffusion of gases in or out. On the left-hand side here, you can see there's an artery, and the right-hand side is a vein. They all have the same three layers, the tunica media or musculosa, which is smooth muscle, and then we have the tunica externa. Veins have valves. Your arteries don't have valves. It's this layer here that we're going to talk about that is damaged. Um, when we talk about vascular irritations, it's this tunica intima or interna that's damaged. Let's just take a look at the arteries. See if we click on this. Okay, so we click here from the heart. We have the arterioles. That's the smooth muscle. These can constrict, okay? Precapillary sphincters, capillary to the heart. So from the heart and then to the heart. Here's an artery, tunica externa, tunica musculosa or media, and tunica interna, simple squamous epithelium. Arteries carry blood away from the heart, and they're going to distribute the uh, oxygen to organs of the body. And the flow of blood carrying nutrients and oxygen is regulated by the arterioles, the smaller arteries. Let's click on capillaries. Let's see what this, where this takes us. Okay, here's an arterial capillary venule here's plasma of blood and these are red blood cells capillaries provide a site for the exchange of nutrients electrolytes oxygen and carbon dioxide uh, ammonia and many other solutes uh, between the blood and the cells veins and venules so here's a vein Again, tunica externa, tunica media, there's a valve, tunica interna, and there's the lumen where blood flows. Here's a arterial, capillary, and a venule. <clears throat> okay, now here's on a cross section. Here's the tunica externa, tunica interna, and there's the muscular layer. So it's this layer, let me just change the color of my pen to, let's say, blue. It's this layer right here, from here to here. It's that tunica media that vasoconstricts or vasodilates. So when it vasodilates, this lumen is going to open up.
And when it vasoconstricts, then this is going to move this way, this is going to move this way, this moves inward, and this moves this way. And then you have vasoconstriction, blood pressure goes up. Vasodilation, blood pressure goes down. Uh, let's look at atherosclerosis and arteriosclerosis. So atherosclerosis is the process in which you get these cholesterol plaques that form on the arterial walls. Notice it doesn't say it's on the uh, endothelial layer or tunica intima. It's getting into the tissues of those walls. I'll show you what that looks like. Arteriosclerosis is when these cholesterol plaques become infiltrated with calcium and it's going to result in hardening of the arteries and an elasticity of the arteries, which means that the blood pressure is going to go up. High blood pressure. So the pathophysiology of damage to these blood vessels um, is several vascular irritants that can damage that tunica intern of the blood vessel. So some vascular irritants, smoking. Now smoking is going to deplete vitamin C. And vitamin C is the precursor to collagen. Collagen is a very, very important protein that blood vessels need. Um, collagen is found in blood vessels, it's found in skin, it's found in hair, it's found in bones. In fact, it makes up about one third of bone is collagen. Okay. Um, alcohol is a vascular irritant. Fried foods, stress, caffeine, physical trauma to blood vessels. Not having enough antioxidant support, right? So when we think of antioxidants, we think of glutathione. And we know glutathione is dependent on glycine, glutamine, and cysteine. So these three are going to make the big G glutathione, glycine, glutamine, and cysteine make glutathione. Environmental toxins and homocysteine levels. You know, when we think of homocysteine, um, sounds like cysteine. I'm going to show you what's involved. And then we have to talk about B6, B9, and B12. We'll talk about cysteine and methionine right now. So let's start with homocysteine right here. Now we're talking about something called methylation pathway. Methylation is really important for DNA synthesis, for RNA synthesis, for myelinating the neural system, myelinating the spinal cord, the brain, closure of the palate, closure of the lips, closure of the neural tube so we don't get neural tube defects, um, for making neurotransmitters, it's important for weight loss. Uh, methylation is extremely, extremely important. And let's take a look here. We start with homocysteine on the bottom right there. Okay, now if we think of homocysteine as liquid sandpaper running through blood vessels, it could be quite damaging. So the body has several ways of getting rid of it. Think of it that way. So here's homocysteine, and in the presence of PLP, which is really B6, which is pyridoxal 5-phosphate, it's converted to cystathione, which can become cysteine. Okay, and now cysteine with glutamine and glycine, we get glutathione. So homocysteine, besides going this way, can come up in this direction and become methionine. But in order to do that, 
it's going to borrow this methyl group from B12. So B12 is what we call cobalamin. But cobalamin comes in different forms. It can come in methylcobalamin, adenosylcobalamin, cyanocobalamin. So in this methylated form, methylcobalamin, this methyl group is going to join forces with homocysteine and give us methionine. And now methionine goes to S adenosyl methionine to S adenosyl homocysteine back to homocysteine. And again, homocysteine can go this way or it can go back to methionine. But what happens when B12, that methylcobalamin, when that methyl group is donated and homocysteine becomes methionine? that methylcobalamin is now simply back to cobalamin and it needs to be remethylated again, right? It has to come this way and become methylcobalamin, but how? It's gonna take this methyl group from 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, it's gonna take that methyl and when it does, now you're that methyl group is gone, so you just have THF, tetrahydrofolate, and that cobalamin becomes methyl cobalamin, right? This is your folate. This is B9. So you have B9 here, you have B12 here, and here you got B6. So there's your B6, B9, and B12. Right? That's why you talk about a B complex. They all work synergistically together. Now, let's move forward with this. So tetrahydrofolate move in this direction and with this transferase enzyme serine hydroxy methyl transferase it becomes 510 methylene tetrahydrofolate and that 510 methylene tetrahydrofolate becomes 5 methyl tetrahydrofolate but in order to become that i'm going to star this here in order to become this we need this very, very, very important enzyme called methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. Anything that ends in ACE is an enzyme. Certain percentage of the population have these SNPs, single nuclear polymorphisms, SNPs. And I'm sure you've heard of M T. H F R. Some people have a mutation or they have this issue with MTHFR, which is this enzyme. And that's when you have the C677T. You can get tested for that. Or the A1290. C. And when they go for this testing, sometimes it's 23andMe, and there's a lot of other labs out there that can do it. Uh, the MTHFR, they will determine whether you're heterozygous or homozygous for C677T or heterozygous or homozygous on A1298C. And depending on the results, the labs will interpret. Um, when you're homozygous, you're just less efficient in making these conversions. So typically the solution would be then taking not folic acid, but taking B9 in this methylated form, taking 5-MTHF in supplemental form so that you can always remethylate and cobalamin can become methylcobalamin again. All right, so really important methylation pathway. So now if that tunica interna or tunica intima cells, if those start to uh, degenerate and die, then the next layer starts to protrude inward. That tunica musculosa can protrude inwards. Um, macrophages, which is a type of white blood cell that come from monocytes. So monocytes become macrophages. Monocytes were always in circulation. When they find some damaged tissues, Monocytes move into those tissues and they engulf any debris, and now it's a macrophage. It's a 
a large cell eating structure like a pac-man it's going to engulf things um, macrophages have many different names when they're in the liver they're called kupfer cells when in the brain they're called microglial cells um, when they're in the lungs they're called alveolar dust cells um, when they're in the skin they're dendritic cells so when they engulf oxidized LDL, they're now called foam cells. So these macrophages, which is a type of white blood cell, is going to infiltrate, it's going to move into the smooth muscle cells, and it's going to look for this oxidized LDL. They're called foam cells because that's exactly what it looks like. This cell right here, if you look inside here, they just look like these little white specks, like little pieces of foam where you get something shipped to you, FedEx or UPS, and you open up the box and you see foam. If you break it, you get these small little white circles in there. These are foam cells. Um, a calcification of the cholesterol plaque leads to hardening of the arteries, and that's called arteriosclerosis. So if we look here, and we follow, we look at number one, this is LDL, LDL cholesterol. It's got a bad rap. You need LDL cholesterol. It's not like it's bad. It just has the potential of being bad when it becomes number two, which is oxidized LDL. So LDL is moving inward. It's moving in from the lumen. This is where blood is flowing in this direction, right? Blood is flowing in the lumen. Here's the lumen of the artery. This is the tunica interna. This is the musculosa. So you have LDLs moving inward, and now in the presence of smoking and alcohol and fried foods and you know poor antioxidant support, maybe poor vitamin D and vitamin E and vitamin C, and poor glutathione production and you know uh, manganese and copper and zinc all being depleted now you start to get oxidation so these ldls are rusting they're becoming bad the body doesn't like these and now here's a monocyte here's the monocyte it starts to roll it starts to adhere and stick Right, they start to roll and it sticks against the endothelial, and then you could see it starts to move inward. Now that monocyte, now that it's in, it becomes a macrophage and it's called a foam cell. That foam cell has engulfed all the damaged LDL. Now we start to get this accumulation of that. And you can see that it's starting to buckle, it's starting to bow, right? And if you look at the space here between the lumen and the endothelial compared to the space here, here it's wider, so blood pressure is lower. Here it's starting to narrow. So here is where the blood pressure goes up. Okay, all of this is inflammatory response. All of this is inflammatory. And as a result of inflammation, blood pressure goes up. So blood pressure isn't really a disease, right? It's more of like a symptom. We look at it as a symptom of inflammation. So down here are the steps. We can see LDL enters the intima. You see you have the oxidized LDL. You can see that now they're engulfed by the monocytes that have become macrophages. And when they engulf them, they become foam cells. And the foam cells release these cytokines. Cytokines are pro-inflammatory messengers and they encourage atherosclerosis. Tumor necrosis factor, in different interleukons that are pro-inflammatory. And what ends up happening if you compare and you compare the lumen here, see how it's nice, it's smooth. The tunica 
interna or the endothelial is intact. But look what's happening here, right? I mean, this is a nice circle. When you look at this, you can see that it's starting to buckle and fold inward. This is that all of that lipid pool, right? So it's not the illusion like you've got plaque buildup and cholesterol buildup here on the tunica interna. It's actually on the inside, all right? And again, just another great picture showing the process and the onset of it, right? Earliest onset, first decade, third decade, fourth decade. You can see again, here's a nice open lumen. And as we start to move in time, you can see how what's happening here in the walls inside so it goes through these different stages. We start here, the initial lesion. There's a fatty streak that starts to accumulate. Then you get some more lipid accumulation in there. You get these lipid pools. Then you get an atheroma, which is a core of extracellular lipids in that area. Then you get a fibroatheroma which is either a single or multiple of lipid cores. You get this very fibrotic or calcific layer there. And then you get a more complicated lesion. Sometimes because of the buckling and because of the pressure, you can actually get a tear. You can get a hemorrhage right there. Okay, and that's where these thrombosis and these clots take place because as blood flow is coming through here it's very turbulent so then you get this very fibrous layer you get fibrinogen which becomes activated with calcium and vitamin k that whole clotting cascade kicks in and you start to get all this fibrous fib all the fibrin starts to lay down and eventually creates a fibrous net and it clots now, if this blood vessel here was going to the heart, it's a heart attack. You get an MI, a myocardial infarction. If it's going to the brain, you get a brain attack or a stroke. Now, let's say it is the heart. Let's say here's the heart. And let's say here's a blood vessel going to it. And let's say over time, so let's say this starts to... You get all this oxidized LDL. And again, this is not in the lumen. This is taking place as we showed in that picture before. So as blood is coming through in this direction, right here, the blood pressure starts building up. Now, over time, this starts to happen. You start to create what's called collateral circulation so that when this does close up rather than no blood making it past here and then the heart becoming necrotic and you get an mi myocardial infarction by the time this closes up enzymes break this down and that blood starts to make it around it creates its own detour and blood can go this way and come around that's called it's like the heart doing its own bypass surgery we talk about cholesterol there's exogenous cholesterol and endogenous cholesterol the majority of the cholesterol in your body is produced uh, by the liver maybe 80 percent or so primarily produced at night which is why when uh, a lot of patients are taking statins uh, statin drugs like simvastatin or lipitor or crestor you know they change the names um, they're typically given at night because that's when the liver makes the majority of it. So majority is endogenous and then exogenous cholesterol is dietary cholesterol. This does not have a major effect on your overall cholesterol as it was once thought. People were afraid to eat eggs and they were afraid they would just have the egg whites. They wouldn't have the egg yolk because the egg yolk had all the cholesterol, but also has acetylcholine. It's got lots of B vitamins and they just had the white of the egg, the protein of the egg. Um, but we know now that it doesn't change much. You know, the Harvard newsletter 
uh, came out years ago. I don't know if it was 2003 or 2004, but long time ago, um, kind of debunked that myth. So um, diet has some effect, but very, very, very little. Most of it is genetics, a lot of it is endogenous cholesterol, and when cholesterol starts to go up, you have to look at um, inflammatory causes. You have to look at cholesterol being pushed out primarily because the tunica intima has been damaged. You know, so think of, think of the wintertime, think of in the north, northeast, when there's snow on these major highways and streets, uh, plows come by, they drop the blade really hard on the street. When these trucks come by and they drop the blade, it makes potholes in the ground. So the DOT, Department of Transportation, comes and they put new asphalt. They kind of like take little tar and they fill in these holes where the potholes were. They, they steam it over and flatten it out. And you can tell it's been patched up. But nonetheless, there's no more potholes. Um, so think of cholesterol as that. When there's damage to the tunica intima, uh, the body pushes out cholesterol to patch it up. So think of it physiologically from a functional standpoint. Um, it's, it's a symptom. It's not a cause of something. It's saying, okay, why did the body choose to all of a sudden increase its output of cholesterol? Where is the fire? Where's the inflammation? Where's the damage? What is the body trying to fix? Okay, and then how is the individual further damaging it by blocking the production of cholesterol that was supposed to fix up that damaged blood vessel? So here are some things that can affect cholesterol. Genetics have a major impact. Diet, very, very little, very little. Hormones, yep. Testosterone is going to increase cholesterol. Uh, females have estrogen, which tends to decrease cholesterol. Very rare to hear of a woman uh, dying of, you know, cholesterol buildup in her blood vessels and, and, you know, heart attacks. Very, very little. Thyroid function and increased serum cholesterol levels. Look to see if there's hypoactivity of the thyroid. When there's decreased serum cholesterol, hypoactive thyroid. Diabetes, uh, again, hyperglycemia or high blood sugar is very damaging to the blood vessels. So if there's damage to the tunica intima, the body's going to kick out more cholesterol. And also they're going to be using lipids and fats and cholesterol for energy if they're not metabolizing glucose very well. LDLs, your low density lipoproteins, that is the cholesterol that the liver makes and it pushes that cholesterol out to the tissues. Those are LDLs. Those are the ones that have a bad rap. And again, they're not bad. How else are you going to make estrogen and testosterone and progesterone and aldosterone unless you have LDLs, low density lipoproteins? HDLs, or high-density lipoproteins, these have the good reputation. Uh, this is the cholesterol going from the tissues back to the liver. Okay, these have like antioxidant properties. So LDLs, they're not bad. It's just that they become oxidized. They become bad. You want to try and have about a 4 to 1 ratio between LDLs to HDLs. Um, arteries that carry blood away from the heart to the tissues. Okay, so arteries, these are um, blood vessels that are taking blood away from the heart and they're driving nutrients and oxygen uh, to other parts of the body. Uh, the walls of the arteries are elastic and allows for them to absorb the pressure created by the ventricles of the heart as they pump blood uh, into the arteries. Because of the smooth muscle, in the tunica media, arteries can regulate uh, their diameter. Elastic arteries and muscular arteries. So elastic arteries are conducting arteries and muscular arteries are distributing arteries. The elastic arteries are larger in diameter, whereas the muscular arteries are medium in diameter. Uh, elastic arteries are, have more elastic fibers, less smooth muscle. 
whereas muscular arteries are more smooth muscle, fewer elastic fibers. The elastic arteries function as a pressure reservoir and the muscular arteries distribute blood to various parts of the body. Arteries as pressure reservoirs. So you can see here as uh, on the left hand side, we have ventricular contraction. Uh, on the right hand side, ventricular relaxation. And you can see the aorta and the elastic arteries on the left hand side. And on the right hand side, you can see the blood continues to flow uh, towards the capillaries on the right hand side. But you can see the difference in the diameter of the arch of the aorta there. Anastomosis is the union of the branches of two or more arteries uh, supplying the same region of the body. Uh, this provides an alternative route for blood flow. Arteries that do not form anastomosis are called end arteries. And if an end artery is blocked and blood cannot get to the particular region of the body, then necrosis takes place, right? Deadening of those tissues. They become black, they become necrotic, black tissue, no oxygen. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, capillaries. Let's look at capillary exchange here. The survival of every cell in our body depends on its ability to obtain the gases, nutrients, and other substances needed to complete all of its chemical processes. Cells also produce byproducts and wastes that must be transported away from the cell. The transfer of substances between the interstitial fluids surrounding each cell and the blood flowing past the cells in the capillaries is referred to as capillary exchange. Nutrient and oxygen-rich blood reaches cells by passing through arteries which branch into increasingly smaller vessels, eventually becoming arterioles that divide to become capillaries. The capillaries recombine into venules and then to veins as they return low nutrient but higher in carbon dioxide blood to the heart. Capillary walls are composed of thin squamous cells, which in most cases have pores through which some substances and fluid can pass. Squamous this cell allows epithelium. the exchange of substances between the bloodstream and the interstitial fluid. Simple diffusion is the primary method for exchange of many substances through the capillary wall. Diffusion from the bloodstream into the interstitial fluid or vice versa is solely dependent upon the substance's concentration gradient on either side of the vessel wall. Lipid soluble substances and gases can pass directly through the thin cells of the capillary wall. Lipid insoluble substances diffuse through pores in the capillaries. Changes in diffusion gradients of nutrients, gases, and wastes may be the result of aerobic cellular respiration within each cell. Active cells consume oxygen during the production of ATP in the mitochondria. As more and more of the intercellular oxygen is used up, its concentration becomes less than that of the surrounding interstitial fluid, causing oxygen to diffuse into the cell. As the oxygen level in the interstitial fluid decreases below the concentration in the bloodstream, oxygen diffuses out of the capillaries into the interstitial fluid. Carbon dioxide is given off during ATP production. When the accumulation of carbon dioxide within the cell exceeds that of the interstitial fluid, the carbon dioxide diffuses out of the cell. As the carbon dioxide level in the interstitial fluid increases to a higher concentration than in the bloodstream, the carbon dioxide diffuses into the bloodstream. Transcytosis provides a method to move larger molecules, such as proteins or antibodies, through the capillary wall. During this process, the capillary cell membrane uses endocytosis to form a vesicle containing the needed protein or antibody.
endocytosis. The vesicle seals to enclose the proteins in a double phospholipid membrane, which passes unaltered through the cell, then passes out of the opposite side by exocytosis. Exocytosis. Bulk flow is a method by which fluid containing small molecules or ions can be transported through the capillary wall. Bulk flow is important in maintaining the volume of interstitial fluid. The outward blood pressure driven movement of fluid and substances small enough to pass through capillary pores is known as filtration. filtration. Particles too large to pass through the capillary pores remain within the capillary. The inward pressure driven movement of interstitial fluid back into the capillaries is known as reabsorption. reabsorption. There are two primary pressures that determine the direction of bulk flow through the capillaries. This is important. Capillary blood pressure, also called capillary hydrostatic pressure, is the outward force causing filtration. Reabsorption is due to plasma colloid osmotic pressure. A colloid is an uneven quantity of suspended particles in the plasma, primarily plasma proteins, which causes osmosis to move interstitial fluid back into the capillaries. Plasma colloid osmotic pressure stays relatively constant throughout the length of the capillary, while blood pressure diminishes with distance along the blood vessel. On the proximal end of the capillaries, the capillary hydrostatic pressure is greatest and becomes the driving force causing filtration of fluid out of the capillaries into the interstitial fluid. As blood passes through the capillary to the distal end, the capillary hydrostatic pressure drops and becomes less than the plasma colloid osmotic pressure, which now becomes the dominant force. As a result, the interstitial fluid is reabsorbed in the distal end of the capillaries. It is the constant exchange of nutrients, gases, fluids, and wastes that provides the environment for each cell in our body to perform its function. Maintaining the quantity and composition of the plasma is critical to the survival of each cell in our body. Well, that was really important. You may want to kind of pause that or rewind it and watch that one again. It was only about five minutes, but great video to understand uh, the direction of flow between filtration and reabsorption, right? You're going to hear that, especially when we talk about the kidney reabsorption and filtration. All right, so capillaries are microscopic vessels that usually connect arterioles and venules. Uh, capillary walls are composed of a single layer of cells and a basement membrane. Because their walls are so thin, capillaries permit the exchange of nutrients and waste between the blood and the tissue cells. Capillaries branch to form an extensive capillary network throughout the tissues and are found near almost every cell in the body. And you can see how these, let's see if I can, you can see how you have these smooth muscle fibers surrounding, and then you have these pre capillary sphincters that are relaxed, but over here they're contracted on the right hand side. So it kind of diverts blood in a more direct fashion when it needs to. Again, here's the picture of veins and venules. Again, you're gonna see those same layers where you have the outer layer, the tunica externa, tunica interna, and the tunica media. And remember, our veins have valves. Venules are small vessels that are formed by the union of sev several capillaries. Uh, venules drain blood from the capillaries into veins. Veins are formed from the union of several venules. Compared to arteries, veins have a thinner tunica interna and media and a thicker tunica externa. Veins have less elastic tissue and less smooth muscle than arteries. Veins contain the valves.
So again, here, when we look at arterioles, they deliver blood to capillaries and help regulate blood flow from arteries to the capillaries. When we look at post capillary venules and then muscular venules. The post capillary venules are going to pass blood into the muscular venules, permit exchange of nutrients and waste between the blood and the interstitial fluid, and they function in white blood cell emigration. The muscular venules pass, pass blood into the vein, act as a reservoir for accumulating large volumes of blood. And then veins return blood to the heart. And they're facilitated by valves that are in the veins. Muscular arteries distribute blood to arterioles. Elastic arteries conduct blood from the heart to the muscular arteries. Capillaries permits the exchange of nutrients and waste between the blood and interstitial fluid. And they're going to distribute blood to the post capillary venules. At rest, the largest portion of the blood is in the systemic veins and individuals, which are considered blood reservoirs, right? So if you look at the percentage, you have 64% of the blood at rest is going to be in the venules or the veins. Systemic arteries and arterioles, 3%. Pulmonary vessels, 9%. The heart is 7 And systemic capillaries are 7%. Uh, substance cross the capillary walls by either diffusion, that little video that we saw before if you want to go back and replay that it talked about these terms diffusion transcytosis remember there was the endocytosis and exocytosis and bulk flow let's look at the capillary exchange the capillaries permit the exchange of nutrients and wastes between the blood and tissue cells Capillary exchange occurs via three basic mechanisms, diffusion, transcytosis, and bulk flow. The most important method of capillary exchange is diffusion. Oxygen, carbon dioxide, steroid hormones, and other lipid soluble substances pass through endothelial cell membranes. Glucose, amino acids, and other water-soluble substances diffuse through intercellular clefts and fenestrations. Transcytosis is used to move small amounts of large lipid insoluble molecules, such as large proteins, across capillary membranes. In this process, substances contained in vesicles enter endothelial cells by endocytosis and exit by exocytosis. Bulk flow is the movement of large volumes of ions, molecules, or particles between blood and interstitial fluid. The movement occurs when a pressure gradient pushes water and dissolved solutes out of or into the capillary. Bulk flow is always from an area of high pressure to an area of lower pressure and continues as long as pressure differences exist. Substances in the flow 
move in unison across fenestrations and intercellular clefts. Fenestrated capillaries allow more bulk flow than continuous capillaries. Tight junctions at the intercellular clefts of continuous capillaries allow little bulk flow. Most solutes can cross with water. However, most larger proteins and formed elements in the blood, such as red blood cells, cannot pass through the fenestrations of the endothelial cell. Bulk flow plays an important role in regulating the relative volumes of blood and interstitial fluid. It does this by balancing specific pressures. Bulk flow is given two names, depending on the direction of movement. There are four factors that determine the net direction of capillary exchange. Blood hydrostatic pressure, generated by the pumping of the heart, promotes filtration by pushing fluid out of the capillary. Blood colloid osmotic pressure is caused by the colloidal suspension of plasma proteins that are too large to pass through fenestrations or gaps between endothelial cells. This pressure acts as if it pulls fluid into the capillary and promotes reabsorption. Protein, right? When you get your blood taken, don't they check for protein and albumin in there? Blood hydrostatic pressure combines with interstitial fluid osmotic pressure, the slight pull of fluids towards the interstitium to promote filtration. In opposition, blood colloid osmotic pressure and interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure, which is near zero under normal conditions, promote reabsorption. The balance of the filtration and reabsorption forces, called Net filtration pressure determines whether blood volume remains steady or changes. At the arterial end of the capillary, filtration pressures are stronger by 10 millimeters of mercury. At the venous end, reabsorption pressures are stronger by 9 millimeters of mercury. As these typical pressures illustrate, about 90% of the fluid volume that is filtered out of the capillary is reabsorbed. The remainder drains into lymphatic capillaries to form lymph. An abnormal buildup of interstitial fluid results in swelling, known as edema. Edema. Edema is a symptom of increased blood hydrostatic pressure, or capillary permeability, decreased blood colloid osmotic pressure, or a problem with normal lymphatic drainage. Blood moves through vessels at a rate that is inversely related to total cross-sectional area. For example, capillaries, when all of them are added together, have a higher cross-sectional area than arteries and veins. Therefore, blood flows more slowly through capillaries. Slower blood velocity in the capillaries allows more time for the exchange of materials. Arteries and veins have lower total cross-sectional areas, so blood velocity is greater. Blood velocity slows as blood travels away from the heart and increases as blood leaves capillaries and returns to the heart. Great video. Great visual. Right, so we spoke about diffusion substances such as oxygen and carbon dioxide, glucose, amino acids, and hormones that are going to cross capillary walls through by a method called simple diffusion. Large lipid insoluble molecules like insulin can cross capillary walls and vesicles. That was the method called transcytosis. That was your endocytosis and exocytosis.
Bulk flow is the passive process in which large number of ions, molecules, or particles in a fluid move together in the same direction. The bulk flow occurs from an area of higher pressure to an area of lower pressure, and it continues as long as the pressure difference is existing. Bulk flow is more important for regulation of the relative volumes of blood and interstitial fluid. So filtrate is pressure-driven movement of fluid and solutes from blood capillaries into interstitial fluid. The blood hydrostatic pressure and interstitial fluid osmotic pressure are going to promote filtration, right? That was what that video was telling us before. So we have the blood hydrostatic pressure and we have the interstitial fluid osmotic pressure that promotes filtration. Reabsorption is pressure driven movement of fluids and solutes from interstitial fluid into the blood capillaries. Whereas the filtration was the pressure driven movement of fluid and solutes from blood capillaries into interstitial fluid, right? Reabsorption is pressure driven movement of fluids and solutes from interstitial fluid into blood capillaries. So the interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure and the blood chyloidal osmotic pressure, that's going to promote reabsorption. And this is what that video demonstrated before. Okay. Uh, blood flow is the volume of blood that flows through any tissue in a given time period. Uh, total flow is cardiac output. Uh, the volume of blood that circulates through systemic or pulmonary blood vessels each minute. The cardiac output is equal to the heart rate times the stroke volume. Uh, cardiac output is equal to the mean arterial pressure divided by the resistance as well. Let's look at the vascular regulation and cardiac output. In the cardiovascular system, the flow of blood is determined by factors that drive and resist moving blood. Even the system's level of production, known as cardiac output, can be measured as a ratio of driving force to resistance. Feedback loops in the central nervous and endocrine systems both change and regulate blood pressure and vascular resistance, and therefore have an important impact on cardiac output. The primary factors that influence circulation are mean arterial blood pressure, systemic vascular resistance, cardiac output. Liquids, such as blood, move from areas of higher pressure to areas of lower pressure. In the heart, where systemic blood flow begins, the pressure gradient is the mean arterial blood pressure. The pressure measured as the blood leaves the left ventricle minus the blood pressure as it enters the right atrium. The right atrial pressure is so low that its effect on systemic flow is discounted. Therefore, systemic flow is said to be directly proportional to mean arterial blood pressure. The greater the pressure gradient, the greater the flow. Systemic blood flow is affected by cardiac output, the volume of blood driven by heart contractions. Cardiac output is the product of heart rate and stroke volume and is influenced by venous return, the contractile strength of cardiac muscle cells, and metabolic demands. The greater the output, the greater the flow. Systemic vascular resistance 
is simply the natural dampening of blood flow that occurs in the vessel. The greater the resistance, the harder it is to move blood through the vessel. Factors that increase resistance are smaller vessel radius, greater blood viscosity, and longer vessel length. That's important. The greater the resistance, the greater cardiac output and blood pressure must be to overcome the resistance. Systemic structures, such as the heart, arteries and arterioles, veins and venules, and the kidneys affect blood pressure, flow, and resistance. Contractions of the ventricles determine blood pressure, which drives the circulation of blood. Blood pressure varies depending on the state of contraction of the ventricles. Maximum blood pressure occurs during contraction, or systole. This is known as systolic blood pressure. In a healthy resting adult, systolic blood pressure is about 120 millimeters of mercury. During relaxation, or diastole, minimum blood pressure occurs. This is known as diastolic blood pressure. In a healthy resting adult, Diastolic blood pressure is about 80 millimeters of mercury. During the contraction cycles of the heart, elastic vessels expand and recoil to maintain a mean arterial blood pressure. Blood pressure is read as the systolic blood pressure over the diastolic blood pressure. For a healthy resting adult, Blood pressure is said to be 120 over 80. Mean arterial blood pressure is calculated as diastolic BP plus a third of the difference between systolic and diastolic blood pressures. This accounts for the fact that diastole lasts longer than systole. Mean arterial blood pressure for a healthy resting adult is about 93 millimeters of mercury. Small arteries and arterioles play a primary role in determining systemic vascular resistance. As blood passes through arterioles, pressure decreases significantly. Decreasing arterial radius and decreased wall elasticity are the main reasons for increased systemic vascular resistance. Small changes in vessel radius can lead to large changes in resistance and blood flow. Vasoconstriction of a vessel brought on by smooth muscle contraction in the arterial wall increases systemic vascular resistance and can reduce blood flow to almost nothing. Vasodilation of a vessel brought on by smooth muscle relaxation in the arterial wall reduces systemic vascular resistance and can dramatically increase blood flow. Venous return is the volume of blood flowing back to the heart from the systemic veins. Increased venous return through the inferior vena cava and superior vena cava leads directly to greater cardiac output. Decreased return contributes to decreased output. Four factors that increase venous return are blood volume regulation by the kidneys, venous tone, and skeletal muscle and respiratory pumping. The kidneys regulate blood volume by reabsorbing salt and water.
When water is resorbed, it is stored in the blood and interstitial fluid. Increased reabsorption increases blood volume and venous return. Decreased reabsorption increases urine production, which decreases blood volume and venous return. Systemic veins and venules also impact venous return. Veins are the major blood reservoirs in the body. The volume of blood stored in a vein depends on its tone or the degree of smooth muscle contraction in the walls of the vein. Increased venous tone constricts the vein, decreasing storage, moving more blood along and increasing return. Decreased tone relaxes the vein, increasing storage, holding more blood and decreasing return. Blood pressure is also created by two pumping mechanisms. Skeletal muscle pumping involves the coordinated compression and decompression of veins and the opening and closing of valves. The process milks blood toward the heart, increasing venous return. Think about what happens here when you have um, people in the military that stand at attention for too long, or if you've ever been in a high school choir or church choir, um, and you have to stand still for too long, everyone knows that in any choir, when you're standing and you're not swaying back and forth and your knees are locked out, people faint, right? You're supposed to keep a slight bend to the knee and sway forward and backward a little bit. So you get this dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. So you get this contraction where the gastroc and the soleus is to pump venous return of blood back upward. You don't get the stagnation. And when that doesn't happen, then uh, people faint. And when you faint, you're lying horizontal and it's a lot easier for blood to get pumped back upward without the gravi gravity pulling blood down. It takes less energy. Okay. Respiratory pumping involves the compression and decompression of veins in the thoracic and abdominal cavities. Movements of the diaphragm during inhalation and exhalation alternately compress and decompress veins in both cavities, pumping blood toward the heart and increasing venous return. The nervous system regulates blood pressure via negative feedback loops in two types of reflexes, baroreceptor and chemoreceptor. Baroreceptors monitor blood pressure. Chemoreceptors monitor chemical composition. Both are located in the carotid sinus and arch of the aorta. Baroreceptor reflexes are major short-term mechanisms for regulating mean arterial blood pressure. The carotid sinus reflex helps maintain blood pressure in the brain. Changes in blood pressure increase or decrease the stretch of the carotid sinus's wall and stimulate baroreceptors. Impulses are sent over sensory fibers in the glossopharyngeal nerves to the cardiovascular center in the medulla oblongata. The aortic reflex, which maintains general systolic blood pressure, works in a similar manner. Stretches in the wall of the ascending aorta and aortic arch send impulses over vagus nerves to the cardiovascular center. If blood pressure drops, there is less stretch. Fewer signals are sent to the brainstem. See now, where is that vagus nerve? This came up a few times uh, in the course. The vagus nerve, cranial nerve number 10, the nucleus is in the medulla oblongata that's protected by the top two vertebrae 
in the neck at C1 and C2. So we know when there's traumatic childbirth and there's subluxation up at the atlas at C1 or C2, and there's disturbance of that vagal nerve, there could be a lot of malfunctions. That's why they look at the act, the, uh, the scoring, the APGAR scoring when children are born, they look at blood pressure, they look at the color of the baby, they listen to their heart, they look at the respirations per minute. Vagal nerve controls all of that. Vagal nerve controls digestion and heart rate and um, everything. It's, it's, it's so very, very important. It's parasympathetically, um, it, it's part of the parasympathetic neural system, the feed and breed, the rest and digest, cranial nerve three, seven, nine, and 10, and sacral segment S2, three, and four. Okay, so the integrity of the upper cervical spine, there's been lots of research with upper cervical adjustments and regulating blood pressure. And I can tell you from my practice over the last 23 years, uh, I've done many pre and post blood pressure checks and been able to balance them out through uh, adjustments of the upper cervical region. The cardiovascular center sends out more sympathetic and fewer parasympathetic impulses. This causes heart rate, myocardial contractility, venous tone, and cardiac output to all increase. Vasoconstriction of small arteries and arterioles causes systemic vascular resistance to increase. These responses cause blood pressure to rise toward normal. Baroreceptor reflexes also work in the opposite direction. An increase in blood pressure causes greater stretch, sending more impulses to the cardiovascular center. The response is decreased cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance, lowering blood pressure toward normal. When there is a large drop in blood pressure, such as during hemorrhage, the baroreceptor reflex does not produce a sustained response. Peripheral chemoreceptors respond to changes in concentration of oxygen, carbon dioxide, and hydrogen. Stimulated chemoreceptors send impulses to the cardiovascular center, which increases sympathetic stimulation to the arterioles and veins. Sustained increases in systemic vascular resistance, cardiac output, and venous tone raises blood pressure toward normal. Hormones regulate blood pressure over the long term. Regulating hormones include renin, angiotensin, and aldosterone, which form what is called the RAA system. Other important hormones are the antidiuretic hormone and atrial natriuretic peptide. Sometimes it was called the RAS system, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. The RAA system is activated by a drop in mean arterial blood pressure. Juxtaglomerular cells in the nephron of the kidney sense the drop in blood pressure and volume and release renin. Renin joins with the plasma protein angiotensinogen to form angiotensin. Angiotensin converting enzymes in the lungs then convert angiotensin to the active hormone angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 targets smooth muscle cells in systemic arterioles. The hormone causes the vessels to constrict, increasing systemic vascular resistance and raising blood pressure toward normal. Angiotensin II also targets cells in the proximal convoluted tubule in the nephron. The reabsorption of sodium and chloride ions sets up an osmotic gradient favoring the retention of water. 
decreases urine production and increases blood volume and pressure. Angiotensin II also targets cells in the adrenal cortex. Again, these cells are stimulated to produce more aldosterone, which prompts the kidneys to reabsorb sodium and water. The increased blood volume boosts cardiac output and raises blood pressure toward normal. When blood pressure drops as the result of dehydration, angiotensin II targets the thirst center in the brain. The sensation of thirst prompts water intake. Water absorbed in the GI tract increases blood volume, boosts cardiac output, and helps raise blood pressure back toward normal. Antidiuretic hormone, or ADH, responds to high blood osmotic pressure due to blood loss and low amounts of water in the blood. ADH secreted by the posterior pituitary gland, binds to smooth muscle cells in arteriole walls. The result is vasoconstriction, which increases resistance and helps raise blood pressure back toward normal. In the kidneys, ADH binds to the principal cells, forming walls of the nephron tubules. The tubules add water pores called aquaporins to surface membranes. This increases the permeability of the tubules to water, counteracting the high osmotic pressure and increasing reabsorption of water. The greater water retention increases blood volume, venous return, and cardiac output, and helps normalize blood and osmotic pressure. ADH also binds to sweat glands, reducing sweating. Again, the retained water boosts cardiac output and helps normalize blood and osmotic pressure. ANP has the opposite regulating effect to the RAA system and ADH. It helps bring high levels of blood pressure and blood sodium down. When high blood volume stretches cells in the atria of the heart, ANP is secreted and targets cells in the kidneys. The hormone inhibits sodium and water retention. Blood volume lowers as more sodium and water is lost in urine. Blood pressure and blood sodium are lowered toward normal. That covered a lot of information. What a great video. Okay, so uh, blood pressure, the contraction of the ventricles generates uh, the blood pressure. Uh, blood pressure is determined by cardiac output, blood volume, and vascular resistance, which we learned quite about in that video. Uh, the higher the blood pressure, the greater the blood flow. Let's look at mean arterial pressure. Liquids, such as blood, move from areas of higher pressure to areas of lower pressure. In the heart, where systemic blood flow begins, the pressure gradient is the mean arterial blood pressure. The pressure measured as the blood leaves the left ventricle, minus the blood pressure as it enters the right atrium. The right atrial pressure is so low that its effect on systemic flow is discounted. Therefore, systemic flow is said to be directly proportional to mean arterial blood pressure. The greater the pressure gradient, the greater the flow. So resistance, the R. Uh, resistance is the opposition to blood flow due to friction between the blood and the walls of the blood vessels. The higher the resistance, the smaller the blood flow. Now, the resistance depends on the size of the blood vessel lumen, the blood viscosity or the thickness, and then the total blood vessel length. So resistance increases 
if that size of the lumen gets shorter. So if you have vasoconstriction, the blood pressure is going to go up. Blood viscosity, obviously, the thicker the blood, the, inc the more the resistance. And if you think about someone who's gaining weight, that they're putting on fat cells, now there's more blood vessels that the body has to create to feed the, the additional pounds, uh, increased fat, increased adipocytes, increased blood vessel length, increased blood pressure because of the increased resistance due to the increased length. The venous return, what the video was showing us before, was that, well, you have valves, the veins have valves, which help to return blood. There's the respiratory pump of the diaphragm moving up and down, uh, stimulating the inferior vena cava and returning blood flow back up. And then the skeletal muscle pump between the gastrox and the soleus in the posterior compartment muscles that we see here. So this is why it's really important. And they tell you even on an airplane, you know, if you're sitting, pump your legs. Uh, it's really bad for people to be, you know, lying down in a hospital bed for an extended period of time without walking around and pumping the blood and circulating fluids throughout the body. So factors that affect blood pressure, um, increased blood volume, the skeletal muscle pump, respiratory pump, vasoconstriction, all that's going to increase venous return. Um, you have decreased parasympathetic impulses, uh, increased sympathetic impulses and hormones from the adrenal medulla. You can see each of those are going to lead to increased heart rate or increased stroke volume, which leads to increased cardiac output, which means increased mean artic uh, arterial pressure. Right On the right-hand side, increased number of red blood cells, as in polycythemia, uh, increased body size, as in obesity, uh, the increase of the RBC is going to increase blood viscosity, the increase in weight or obesity or adiposity increase total blood vessel length, those are going to increase the, the resistance. And decreased blood vessel radius, which means vasoconstriction, all those are going to increase uh, vascular resistance, which is going to increase mean arterial pressure. Okay, the video spoke about the control of the blood pressure and the blood flow, um, the medulla oblongata that contains the cardiovascular centers there, as well as the respiratory center. Um, it's a group of neurons that regulate heart rate, the contractility, and the blood vessel diameter. So as a doctor of chiropractic, what I love about this is right here in this area, this is where we have the C1 vertebrae. And then right in here, we have the C2 vertebrae. So we have the atlas and axis. And we can use these as a way of sending impulses into the neural system to have a major impact on what you're looking at here. Okay, so input to the cardiovascular centers from the higher brain centers, the cerebral cortex, the limbic system, which is the emotional brain, and then the hypothalamus. Uh, input is also coming in from proprioceptors, which are going to monitor joint movements. Then there's baroreceptors, which is going to monitor the blood pressure, especially in the carotid sinus. And then chemoreceptors for the blood acidity levels based on um, hydrogen, carbon dioxide, and oxygen. Now the output is going to be to the effectors, um, the heart. If the vagal nerve is stimulated, which is parasympathetic, you're going to get decreased heart rate. If the cardiac accelerator is kicked in gear, which is sympathetic stimulation, you're going to get increased heart rate and contractility. And again, vasomotor-wise, sympathetics are going to make the tunica musculosa vasoconstrict as so many hormones, right? We were talking about the renin aldosterone angiotensin system. Uh, Barrow receptors, uh, these are important pressure sensitive sensory neurons that monitor the stretch that takes place within the walls of the blood vessels. 
So we have one here. Bar receptors in the carotid sinus and also in the arch of the aorta. Very important. Um, negative feedback regulation of blood pressure. Um, pretty much self self-explanatory. But let's take a look at the video, put it together for us. Arterial blood pressure determines how much blood flows into the capillaries, where the exchange of nutrients and wastes between blood and body cells occurs. If the pressure is too low, not enough blood goes into the capillaries. If the pressure is too high, blood vessels can break, causing internal bleeding and possibly strokes. The aortic arch and common carotids are arteries that supply blood to critical areas of the body. The aortic arch supplies the body, and the common carotids supply the head. Within these major arteries are structures called baroreceptors that measure blood pressure and send nerve impulses up to the brain. If pressure is high, the walls stretch. If pressure falls, the walls are less stretched. Baroreceptors send information to the cardiovascular center in the medulla oblongata in the brain. When blood pressure drops, the slower rate of impulses from the baroreceptor conveys this disruption to homeostasis to the CV center. The CV center sends its own nerve impulses out to the heart and many of the blood vessels. CV is cardiovascular center. The heart starts to beat faster, sending blood to the arteries at a faster rate. It also beats with greater strength, sending greater amounts of blood to the arteries with each beat. The nervous signals from the brain also signal secretion of hormones that constrict blood vessels, increasing their resistance. As the pressure of the blood in the arteries goes up, the change is detected by the baroreceptors that send the information about the restored blood pressure up to the brain. When the brain receives this response, it will cut back on its stimulation to the heart and blood vessels because homeostasis has now been achieved. Okay, so when we look at factors that can influence blood pressure, we look at cardiac output, what are the things that can increase heart rate and contractility? Norepinephrine and epinephrine. What are the effects on blood pressure that can increase it? Right, when they think of norepinephrine and epinephrine, well, what gland should we be thinking of with this? Think back to endocrine. Remember, there was a structure histologically that looked like this, and it had a cortex, and then it had a medulla. So the, cor the adrenal cortex and the adrenal medulla. Right, so in here in the adrenal medulla is where the catecholamines are produced, like norepinephrine or noradrenaline and adrenaline. When we talk about uh, systemic vascular resistance, vasoconstriction, angiotensin II, ADH, antidiuretic hormone, and then norepinephrine and epinephrine again. When we talk about the opposite effect of vasodilation to decrease blood pressure. Now the heart produces atrial natriuretic peptide and vasodilation. We got to talk about NO, nitric oxide, which comes from arginine. Vasodilation. Blood volume. If we want to increase blood volume, aldosterone, or ADH. If we want to decrease blood volume, 
that's ANP, atrial natriuretic polypeptide. When you look at the first two letters, natriuretic, that's Na, which is sodium. Okay, so you have aldosterone. Aldosterone is designed to increase or to retain and hold on to sodium. If we're holding on to sodium, we're holding on to water. There's your antidiuretic hormone. If we're getting rid of sodium, we're getting rid of water, that's going to decrease blood volume. Okay, so this is a really good uh, illustration, a good, good graph to kind of look at and figure out. But it put, does put it all together. Uh, autoregulation is the ability of a tissue to automatically adjust its own blood flow to match its metabolic demands for delivery of oxygen and nutrients and the removal of waste. Uh, physical and chemical stimulus can lead to autoregulation. Okay, this is an important um, an important diagram here or slide because it shows all the different major uh, arteries and where you can palpate them and feel them. Um, important. Let's look at some of the biggies like temporal artery. If we have clients or patients um, that are complaining of pain at the temple, especially a smoker, uh, we have to consider temporal uh, arteritis. Uh, the common carotid artery, everyone uh, knows how to check their own uh, pulse. You know, a lot of runners take their fingers and they put it right in front of or superficial to the SCM muscle. For that, when taking blood pressure, we put the stethoscope right over here, over the cubital fossa where the brachial artery is. Then we know about the radial pulse for the radial artery. Then there's the femoral artery. Behind the knee is the popliteal and posterior tibial. And between the first and second digits right here in the metatarsal is the dorsal pedal artery. Um, with men with erectile dysfunction, oftentimes the popliteal is assessed and the dorsal pedal. Uh, usually the lower extremity pulses are going to be weak with erectile dysfunction. And again, just showing the palpation, which means how you can feel and assess the different um, blood vessels at different parts of the body. Uh, okay, circulatory roots. Now we're talking about actual blood flow. Uh, so this may be a good place if you want to take a break. Uh, you can pause it here, or if you want to keep going, then we could just chug along and talk about different, um, different roots. Um, so here it's important to remember blood flow through the heart and when we have deoxygenated blood, blue, right here, that's coming into the right atrium, then into the right ventricle, into the pulmonary trunk, to the pulmonary arteries, right and left, into the lungs. Lungs are picking up the oxygen, and it's going to drive it into the pulmonary veins, back into the left atrium, into the left ventricle, and then left ventricle is going to pump from inferior to superior. It's going to pump the blood through the aortic semilunar into the arch of the aorta and it's going to pump it uh, systemically it's going to pump it up to the brain it's going to go down the arch of the aorta to the thoracic aorta to the abdominal aorta it's going to hit all the abdominal organs then it's going to go to the lower extremity then we have to find a way to get the blood back to the heart, from the brain to the heart, from the fingertips to the heart, and then from the toes back to the heart, and then the digestive organs back to the heart, and from the heart itself back to the heart. <laughs> Can't forget that. So let's look at some of the systemic circulation. We'll talk about some of the big blood vessels here. Uh, so let's... This is just a good overview of some of the main blood vessels. So there's the arch of the aorta, right here. That's the arch. There are some main blood vessels that come off of it. One large one coming this way to the right side of the body. 
and that's called a brachiocephalic trunk. Brachio for arm, cephalic to the head, which means off of that blood vessel is going to be a few that go up this way to the head. And then there's going to be another one that goes down the arm. In the thoracic region is the thoracic aorta. The landmark here is the diaphragm. If you're above the diaphragm, thoracic aorta. If you're below it, you're in the abdominal region for the abdominal aorta. We'll talk about, we'll get a better close-up view of some of these blood vessels here. And then we're going to break it down. We're also going to break down blood vessels from the heart to the fingers, from the heart down to the toes, from the heart up to the brain. And then we'll get into the venous system and we'll work backwards. Toes up to the heart, digestive organs up to the heart, fingertips back up to the heart. So here's the arch of the aorta right here. And then you can see brachiocephalic trunk, we'll call that number one, left common carotid, number two, left subclavian, number three. Those are the three main branches that come off the arch uh, of the aorta. Now on the left-hand side, here's left, here's left, and here's the right side. On the right-hand side, there's only the brachiocephalic trunk. So off of the brachiocephalic is where we're going to have the common carotid and subclavian coming off of it. Okay. Then we have the ascending aorta. Right, so coming up, ascending aorta, arch of the aorta. Now it's descending down. So here's the thoracic aorta. And that's what it's called if you're above the diaphragm. Once you're below the diaphragm, now here is the abdominal aorta. And off the abdominal aorta, we're going to have a very important region called the celiac trunk, which has three blood vessels coming off of it. We have one is the left gastric, two is the splenic, and the third is the common hepatic coming off of it. So right there, that's your celiac trunk. Then another important blood vessel is the superior mesenteric inferior mesenteric, and we have the gonadals. There's a left renal and a right renal artery as well. And then there's the adrenal arteries. Going to the lumbar vertebra, lumbar arteries. Then the continuation of the abdominal aorta. It's going to branch into a right common iliac and a left common iliac. Anytime you see the word common, whether it's the common iliacs or up on top, the common carotids, it's safe to assume that they're going to divide into an internal and external something. So if it's a common iliac, it's going to divide into an internal and external iliac. If it's a common carotid, it's going to divide into an internal and external carotid. Uh, up on top, if you look at the left subclavian, subclavian under the clavicle, after the subclavian, right around second rib or so, now it's in the armpit. It's called the axillary artery. Then after the axillary, it follows the humerus or the brachium, so it's called the brachial artery. Then in the forearm, you have a, the radial and ulnar bone, so there's a radial and ulnar artery. And then you're in the palm, so there's going to be a deep and superficial palmar arch. And then off of that, going into the digits, digital arteries. 
off of the heart. Uh, let's just see. Here again is the arch of the aorta. And then you have one, two, three main blood vessels. This one here is the brachiocephalic. That's number one. Number two, left common carotid. Number three, left subclavian. And you can see them here as well. Off the ascending aorta, we can't forget that there's going to be a right coronary artery, and there's going to be a left coronary artery as well. The right coronary comes this way, and it's going to move and become the marginal. The left coronary comes right down. There's a fork in the road. One goes around to the back. That's called the circumflex branch or circumflex artery. And one goes right down in that interventricular groove and it's called the anterior interventricular branch. I like this picture because it shows the one, ascending aorta, two, arch of the aorta, three, descending aorta. Then you have the brachiocephalic, left common carotid, and left subclavian. And then what we said was if we look at the left common carotid, it divides into a left external and a left internal carotid. When you look at the brachiocephalic trunk, it's going to divide also into a common carotid and a right subclavian. The right subclavian in the armpit becomes the axillary and the arm becomes the brachial in the forearm becomes the radial and ulnar artery. In the fore in the palm there is a deep and a superficial palmar branch. And then going right into the fingers we're going to have digital arteries. Going up into the brain is the circle of Willis and the circle of Willis is going to encompass what we see up here. We'll go over these arteries in another illustration that's a little bit better. But nice picture, again showing arch of the aorta. If we look at the right hand side, now we have the brachiocephalic, which is here brachiocephalic trunk. This does not need designation left or right because there's only one, so it's just called brachiocephalic. You need to know that that's on the right-hand side. Okay, it's on the right-hand side. And then the brachiocephalic is going to fork in the road where it becomes the right common carotid and the right subclavian. Right subclavian becomes the right axillary, right axillary, right brachial. And then the forearm becomes the radial and ulnar arteries. And then the palm, the deep palmar, and then the superficial palmar arch. And then you have the digital arteries. Okay. Circulation now going up into the brain. Here is the cervical spine. If you think back to some of the bony anatomy and you look at the cervical vertebrae, the transverse processes have holes in them called the transverse foramen. Through the transverse foramen of C1 to C6 is the vertebral arteries. The vertebral arteries go through them. Here's the right common carotid. And then you see the fork in the road. It's the internal carotid that goes deep into the brain external carotid stays external, stays superficial. When we look at the circle of Willis, this is now the circulation going into the brain to feed the brain. So it starts off with right and left vertebral arteries. Those vertebrals unite, become one. So here's one vertebral, two vertebrals, they converge, and they're going to form the basilar artery. Then the basilar artery comes up 
and right in here is the circle, so the circle of Willis. Okay. Now, let me show you the cerebral arteries because there's three. There's going to be a posterior cerebral. There's going to be a middle cerebral. And then there's going to be anterior cerebral arteries. Okay, again, we did the two vertebrals. Both vertebrals come up, they unite, become the basilar. Basilar artery goes through the magnum foramen, the bottom of the skull. And then as that comes up, there's going to be several branches, one going to the back of the brain, posterior cerebral, middle brain, middle cerebral, front of the brain, anterior cerebral. Okay, again, we're talking about the circle of Willis, blood supply to the brain. Now there's two others, two biggies, anterior and posterior communicating arteries right here on this side. This is the posterior communicating and it goes this way too. So this is the posterior communicating. And if there's a posterior communicating, it's going to be an anterior communicating. That one's a lot smaller right there. Here's the anterior communicating, posterior communicating. And here's your internal carotid. One, two. So if this vertebral artery here, whoop, let me get the pen back on. If this one starts to get blocked, well, we still have a way of getting up this way. If this one gets blocked, well, we still have a way of getting up through here. That's what it looks like from underneath. Again, so you're going to have one vertebral, another vertebral, basilar artery, this one, and this one. That's your posterior cerebral here and here, middle cerebral. Then you have this one and this one, anterior cerebral. Then this little short little section that I'm boxing in here, that's the anterior communicating, whereas the posterior communicating is this way. And then here's your internal carotids. Here's the vertebral artery going through the transverse foramen of the cervical vertebrae. Here's a CT scan showing the vertebral artery going through the transverse ring, but you can also see the common carotids there as well. Just to show you some of the other anatomy so you know what you're looking at over here. Uh, this is the zygomatic bone. This is the angle of the mandible. There's your TMJ, temporomandibular joint. There's your external auditory meatus. Here's your mastoid bone. Just shows that when you turn and rotate your cervical spine, there's a lot of elasticity. And those vertebral arteries are very, very elastic and flexible. Uh, maybe a little bit less so in perhaps uh, smokers. Um, they become a little bit more vulnerable. People that are deficient in vitamin C, um, young ladies that are on the oral contraceptive that may have higher homocysteine levels. Um, it's just got to be careful with the vascular uh, irritants. But these are very, very strong, very strong uh, blood vessels. They withstand a lot of force. Okay, so in the abdominal region, uh, let's take a look. Here was the celiac trunk on this region here. So here's the common hepatic. You got the splenic and left gastric. Those three are from the celiac trunk.
I like this picture right here because it shows here's the celiac trunk here here's your ascending colon transverse colon descending colon right so right here is the superior mesenteric and the superior mesenteric and the inferior mesenteric arteries these are going to control if we talk about the superior mesenteric it's pretty much all of the small intestine the wadlam jejunum and ilium ascending colon and about half of the transverse colon you can see it ends right around there okay and then the rest of it's going to be inferior mesenteric so we can see here oh, let me go back here's the inferior mesenteric you can see that it's going to go to the other half of the transverse colon and get everything else okay When we look at the abdominal aorta, we look at its branches. Here is the abdominal aorta. Then it splits into the common iliacs. We said anything with the common is going to divide into an internal and an external iliac. External iliac becomes the right femoral. The femoral is going to go down in back of the knee. It's the popliteal. And then there's going to be an anterior tibial and a posterior tibial. Let's see if we can show you on the leg here. Common iliac is your internal and external iliac. So the external to the femoral, right behind the knee is the popliteal. And if we look at the popliteal on the right-hand side, which is the posterior view, popliteal is right behind the knee. And that's going to divide. There's going to be an anterior tibial and a posterior tibial. The anterior tibial comes right out in front between the tibia and the fibula. It's going to come down right between that first and second toe and give us that right dorsal pedal. The dorsal pedal, if we look on the right hand side, again, you can see the popliteal coming down. And now it follows the tibia where it's the posterior tibial. And then there's the other one that's following the fibula. And that's just called a peroneal artery or the fibular artery. The fibular artery and the posterior tibial artery would kind of be equivalent to what you have in the forearm where you have the radial and ulnar artery. And then in the palm, how there was a palmar arch and the foot is a plantar arch. Okay, there's a medial and lateral plantar arch. On the venous side, now when we look at the venous system, the thinking is a little different. Now we have to figure out, well, how does blood go from the brain to the heart? How does it go from the fingertips to the heart? How does it go from the feet to the heart? How does it go from the digestive organs back to the heart? And how does it go from the heart to the heart? So here, now blood has been delivered to the brain. We don't have internal and external carotid veins, what we have here in the brain are jugulars. So from the brain, you're going to have all of these sinuses. All of these different sinuses that are going to be draining. Eventually, they're going to lead into the internal jugulars and the internal jugulars they actually find their way into the left brachiocephalic and the right brachiocephalic arteries uh sorry the right and left brachiocephalic veins 
Both brachiocephalic veins are going to lead into the superior vena cava. Superior vena cava is going to lead right into the right atrium of the heart. Okay, so here we have all of these sinuses. Superior sagittal sinus, inferior sagittal sinus, straight sinus, transverse sinus, sigmoid sinus, cavernous sinus, right? So all those sinuses, again, eventually it's going to lead right into the internal jugular vein, right into the brachiocephalic, right into the superior vena cava. Just as there was a vertebral artery, there's going to be a vertebral vein. Now going from the fingertips up to the heart, everything's pretty much the same, you know, in terms of the names of the veins based on the arteries. Um, there's only a few additional ones um, that we didn't mention because we don't have our arteries by their name. Um, that's going to be a lateral vessel that's called the cephalic, and then there's going to be the basilic, which is more medial. Other than that, there's digital arteries, there's digital veins, there's radial arteries, there's going to be a radial vein. There is a ulnar artery, there's going to be an ulnar vein. There's a brachial artery, there's brachial veins. Right, so here's the radial artery, ulnar artery, brachial artery. Oh, sorry, just I'm just in my mind. I'm checking off where there's arteries, and then there's the analogous venous system. There's a radial artery. There's a radial vein. There's a ulnar artery, ulnar vein, brachial artery, brachial vein. There's a axillary artery, axillary vein. Subclavian artery, subclavian vein. Okay, now it's going to lead into the superior vena cava, into the right atrium. Again, the additional ones, cephalic and the basilic. Okay, so if we look at the arm, now we start at the fingertips, we work our way up. You have the palmar veins, digital veins. Moving up into the forearm. Now, on the lateral side of the forearm, cephalic vein, and that's also lateral arm. Medial forearm, basilic, also here, which is lateral arm, is basilic. Okay, they're going to lead up. The armpit, axillary vein, into the brachiocephalic vein, from brachiocephalic, right here into the superior vena cava. Close up of the hand. Here up on top, you can see the internal jugular, left and right. Subclavian vein, right and left. Brachiocephalic vein, right and left. Now, draining here in the ribs, let's look here. You have hemiozygous, azygous. They're both going to lead into the superior vena cava. We're going to show you the hepatic portal vein, 
lymphatic vein. They're different structures. Here's the inferior vena cava, common iliacs with both internal and external iliac. Again, we have to we talk about the venous system. We're starting at the feet, and we got to work our way up this way. So again, just kind of like in the hand, I had the digitals. Then there was the palmar arches. So now here we've got the dorsal. Venous arch, dorsal metatarsal arch. On the bottom side, plantar venous arch. They start to move their deoxygenated blood upward. Anterior tibial vein, posterior tibial vein, popliteal vein. Femoral vein, external iliac vein, internal iliac vein, common iliac vein, anterior into the inferior vena cava. Now the one that runs the full length, there is the great saphenous vein. That one runs almost the full length from the upper thigh all the way down to the foot. And if there's a greater saphenous, there's going to be a small saphenous as well. Great picture, great illustration here, just showing how when blood is delivered to the digestive organs, they have to find a way back to the heart. So they have to find their way into the superior mesenteric. They have to find their way into the inferior mesenteric. And you also have, again, the splenic vein, which is here. And that's going to lead into here, which is called the hepatic portal vein. It's going to divert blood into the liver where it's going to detox, filter, and clean. And after it's detox, filtered, and clean from the liver, it's got to go into the inferior vena cava where now you have the hepatic vein. So the hepatic portal vein leads blood into the liver, and then the hepatic, the hepatic veins are the exit route from the liver into the inferior vena cava, from the inferior vena cava into the right atrium. Again, another good view showing the hepatic portal vein right there, and here is the hepatic Superior mesenteric vein, inferior mesenteric vein. So the hepatic portal circulation is designed to divert blood from the digestive system to the liver uh, before it enters general circulation. The hepatic portal vein is formed from joining of the superior mesenteric vein, splenic vein, and the hepatic portal circulatory route is referred to as the portal system. And it's uh, after it's diverted into the liver, it's going to go from the liver into the IVC through the, by way of the hepatic vein. Pulmonary circulation. We did this when we did the heart. So it's going to go from superior vena cava into the right atrium, right atrium into the right ventricle, right ventricle into the pulmonary trunk, pulmonary trunk into the left and right pulmonary arteries. Pulmonary arteries are going to lead the deoxygenated blood into the lungs. And then the lungs, it's going to lead into the pulmonary veins, pulmonary veins into the left atrium, left atrium into the left ventricle 
left ventricle is going to pump blood into the arch of the aorta back into systemic circulation. Just FYI, if you look down, here's the diaphragm. Here's your inferior vena cava. So breathing and respiration is so important. It creates a pump on the IVC. When you inhale, remember the diaphragm moves down. When you exhale, it pushes back up. That within itself is a pump. Uh, fetal circulation, just wanted to show you here between the right atrium and left atrium, there's a foramen ovale, which becomes the fossa ovalis. You can see it's opened right there. It's a non, it's not closed here. And then you'll see the ductus arteriosus, which becomes the ligamentum arteriosus. And it's this connection here. Okay, he, this one is just showing the fetal circulation. And again, you can see that bypass of the foramen ovale, shunting blood from the right atrium into the left atrium. And then there's the duct, uh, not the, the ductus arteriosus. Going from the pulmonary trunk into the arch of the aorta which is here. That little small section there. With aging, there's a little bit of loss of compliance of the aorta. There's a reduction in the cardiac muscle fiber size, a little bit of a loss of cardiac muscle strength. Um, this is where um, coenzyme Q10 is really important for heart strength and heart function. Um, we know that when people use statins, it depletes the coenzyme Q10. And a lot of people develop uh, cardiac uh, disorders as a result. A lot of ventricular failures and a lot of um, uh, regurgitations can take place or ventricular ectopies can take place. Uh, decline in maximum heart rate, increase in systolic uh, pressure. Really nice uh, picture, great illustration here showing the connection between uh, the cardiovascular systems and every system out there. Okay. Let's look at blood pressure homeostasis. Blood pressure is the force of blood on its vessels as it is propelled to virtually every cell in the body. In order to provide sufficient blood flow to tissues, it is essential that our blood pressure is kept within a specific range. If it is too high, it can cause damage to the blood vessels. Or if too low, we can lose consciousness. There are three parameters which our body uses to maintain the homeostasis of blood pressure, cardiac output, blood volume, and the resistance to the flow of blood through vessels. Cardiac output is the quantity of blood ejected by the heart every minute. Cardiac output is the product of two factors, the stroke volume, which is the amount of blood ejected during every heart contraction, and the heart rate, which is the number of beats per minute. We can alter cardiac output, resulting in a similar alteration in blood pressure by changing either stroke volume or heart rate. An even greater effect is caused by changing both simultaneously.
Blood volume exerts pressure on the blood vessel walls. If blood pressure decreases, the body responds by increasing the total blood volume. This response then raises blood pressure to increase blood flow. If blood pressure becomes abnormally high, then the body responds by reducing blood volume, thereby decreasing blood pressure. The third factor that governs blood pressure, resistance to blood flow, is due to friction between blood and the walls of the blood vessels. A decrease in the radius of blood vessels is the primary cause of greater friction. As the resistance to blood flow becomes greater, blood backs up on the proximal side, causing an increase in blood pressure. The smallest vessels capable of changing their radius are the arterioles. The collective constriction of arterioles throughout the body results in what is known as total peripheral resistance, which affects systemic arterial blood pressure. To understand how blood pressure is regulated, let's consider the responses that occur when blood pressure is low. Within the medulla oblongata, an area known as the cardiovascular center receives input from baroreceptors in the neck and aortic arch. Blood pressure to the brain and systemic blood pressure is detected. The cardiovascular center quickly responds to low blood pressure by stimulating the sympathetic nervous system to increase the contractility and speed of the heart, causing an increase in cardiac output. It also causes significant constriction of arterioles, which increases total peripheral resistance. The combination of greater cardiac output and increased resistance causes a rapid increase in blood pressure. Hormones can also raise blood pressure. Decreased blood flow to the kidneys causes them to release the enzyme renin into the bloodstream. This results in the activation of angiotensin II, which increases blood pressure in two ways. One response to the activation of angiotensin II is the release of aldosterone from the adrenal cortex. This causes the kidneys to retain additional sodium, resulting in additional retention of water. Aldosterone, in conjunction with the water-retaining antidiuretic hormone, increases plasma volume, providing greater cardiac output to raise blood pressure. Angiotensin II is also a powerful vasoconstrictor, which increases total peripheral resistance, resulting in increased blood pressure. Baroreceptors also provide input indicating high blood pressure to the cardiovascular center which sends the signal to increase parasympathetic stimulation and decrease sympathetic stimulation. This will decrease the contractility and speed of the heart to lower blood pressure. It also allows arterioles to relax to decrease total peripheral resistance. Hormones may decrease blood volume, which leads to lowering blood pressure. Stretch receptors in the atria of the heart produce atrial natriuretic peptide when too much blood volume is detected. Atrial natriuretic peptide inhibits the renin angiotensin II sequence, causing the kidneys to excrete more sodium and water. This will decrease blood volume. The homeostasis of systemic blood pressure can be summarized as the control of three factors, cardiac output, the resistance to the flow of the blood through the blood vessels, and the blood volume. Blood pressure homeostasis is maintained throughout our active lives with incredible accuracy, able to meet the demands of each cell.
Okay, so normal blood pressure is supposed to be less than 120 over 80. I know usually you've heard of 120 over 80 is normal, systolic is 120, the 80 being diastolic, we really want it less than 120 over 80. If it's more than that, we're starting to think that uh, there's, you know, maybe some hydration issues, um, perhaps uh, an imbalance between uh, magnesium and calcium and potassium, hydration levels, um, infla inflammatory issues in the body. The prehypertension is going to be now 120 to 139 and 80 to 89. And then in hypertension, there's stage one and stage two. Stage one is the 140 to 159. And greater than 160 is going to be stage two hypertension. Um, systolic is the amount of pressure in the arterial system when the ventricles are contracting, and diastolic is when they're relaxing. Okay. So I know there was a lot of information, it was over two hours long, but, um, you know, just split it up. A lot of information.